Welcome to the Intermarket Analysis video update. This is a video that I do once a week where we not only look outside of the S&P 500 at other stock indexes and other sectors, but we also look outside of the stock market. We look at the bond market, we look at the commodities markets, because sometimes we can get some clues as to what's happening inside the S&P 500 by looking at other indexes and even other markets. This is being prepared from Monday, October 16th. The first area that we look at is valuation. And we look at this three ways. We look back historically to see is the S&P 500 on a historical basis considered to be expensive, inexpensive, or fairly priced. Then we look at things right now, and that's the most important part. But then we also look forward going into the future to see what is the market anticipating valuations will be looking out into the future because that justifies current prices right now. First area that we look at is the TTM or trailing 12 months. And we use a static scale from 10 being inexpensive, 15 being fairly, fairly priced, and 20 and above being expensive. And we can see in this chart, when we're above the red dash line, here's the black line for the S&P 500. We're above that. So on a historical basis, the S&P 500 is considered to be expensive. And we can see how this has changed over a period of time. On the bottom is the spread between the two. When we're above the zero line, that means that the S&P 500 is above the P.E. ratio of 20. We can also look at this based on historical events. Here's the 1987 crash. We had the dot-com boom and bust, the housing crisis. And then over on the right-hand side, where we're at right now, to get some perspective. Now, we can remain expensive or inexpensive or fairly priced for extended periods of time. The stock market tends to be more optimistic, so it tends to look at things from a higher valuation standpoint. You can see we can go many years where we're considered to be expensive. So we don't necessarily use this to make day in and day out decisions. We want to be aware of the situation because sometimes when we're overvalued, that's when the market's a little bit more vulnerable but this can last a long time. We use other charts to help us determine when is a more positive or a negative time in the market. We also look at another measurement called the Schiller PE ratio, which looks at, you also may hear this called CAPE. This looks at more of an average over a period of time to get an idea, again, are we expensive or inexpensive or fairly priced? The current reading coming in right now is 29.58. To give you an idea, the median and the mean is between 16 and 17, and it's been this for quite a while. So we're almost double on a historical basis where we're at right now compared to what the median and the mean have been historically. We can also look at this chart and see, well, when we had Black Tuesday, that was 1929. We're just about at that level right now. We can also look at Black Monday, which was the 1987 crash just to give us some historical perspective. So right now, on a historical basis, this chart also suggests that we're overvalued, but we've been overvalued for quite a while. Then we look forward. We look at PE ratios. These are based on analyst projections and forecasts, and the S&P 500 right now is coming in at 18. So if we use that static scale from 10, 15 to 20, we're above the 15 level, but we're still below the 20 level. So looking out, the market is not necessarily expensive. To get some other perspective, we look at the mid caps, which are coming in at 12.7 right now. That's below the 15, but above 10. We look at the small caps, which are at 11.9. They're also below 15, but still above 10. We look at all of these different projections going forward because they have a tendency to move in the same direction. They're different colors to make them a little bit easier to read. And then we look at two different types of ways of analyzing the small caps. We have the Russell 2000, which is a popular index used for a long time. Then there's the S&P 600, which is also a small cap index. I use the blue one when I'm looking at valuations because that lines up with the 10, 15, 20 scale where the Russell 2000, it comes up with a different value, but we can still see how it's been changing over time. Another area that we look at is growth versus value. When the market is more positive and you want to buy low and sell high, looking at capital gains, that's when you want to focus on growth stocks. When we run into some difficulties and maybe you're not as concerned or you're worried about capital gains not happening, 
you might get into more value stocks that pay dividends, that are more established, that have been around a long time. And these stocks tend to hold up better when the market runs into problems. That's when you get into value stocks. And then we can look at this on a scale. Here's the growth index where we take it by itself, where we're chopping more or less sideways, but we continue to be in an uptrend. However, the blue line is starting to come down. That's a little bit of a concern, but it hasn't crossed negative at least yet. We also look at a value index, which is clearly in a downtrend, and it has not been performing well in 2023. Then we do some analysis between the two. We look at ratios. We're on the top. We have a growth to value ratio, showing how, showing how growth is outperforming value. And then on the bottom, we have another ratio showing how value is underperforming growth. The reason why we do this, and we look at a lot of different charts, you can see where they crossed over. There was a little bit of a time lag between the two. Different indexes, ETFs, they can weight things differently and calculate things differently within that particular measurement. And we want to make sure that we're seeing the same things at the same time. We can look at an ETF of the growth to value ratio showing how growth is now continuing to outperform value. This is an inverse of that same chart showing how value is underperforming growth. Then we look at some other indexes showing how growth is outperforming value and how value is underperforming growth. So we're seeing some confirmation here. We also look at another index that shows us how growth continues to outperform value. So this is more of a buy low, sell high friendly environment. Even though we've had a difficult time in the market with September and October's kind of on the fence right now, once we topped out in July and started to hit some difficulties, we want to keep an eye on growth to see is it still outperforming because that can be under the surface and give us some confidence that at some point we might see the market bounce back up. Then we look at another measure between growth and value, showing how growth is still holding up quite well when compared to value, showing a lot of improvement. We're above all of these lines that make the, up this rainbow measurement. Then we look at an inverse showing how value is underperforming. Even though it bounced up lately, it's still been underperforming overall. And we're looking for longer term trends with this. We look at small cap growth and compare it with small cap value where it has been doing okay. We've fallen back lately. Small caps in and of themselves by looking at the index, you can see they've been under a lot of pressure lately and they're coming back down and testing this previous low. We're also getting to the low end of this support level now. So the index is having some trouble, but for right now anyway, even though growth is underperforming in the short term, it has been holding up in the longer term. It continues to be in an uptrend. Then we look at mid-cap growth and value. And this is where a lot of the underlying strength has come in 2023, where we can see we've been in a longer-term uptrend. It's turned down over the last few days. The index has been under a lot of pressure, but this still continues to hold up fairly well. Looking at the most important one that I look at for the S&P 500, we can see the growth is actually breaking out when compared to value, looking on an end-of-day chart. I also have some intraday charts that show you this when I do the daily videos. Then we keep an eye on inflation. We look at the CRB index, and that's a monthly index on the top. Later on, we'll look at a daily chart, but we're above this red line, which is a moving average, showing that the CRB index is going higher. That could be inflationary. So what we do down below is we take inflationary parts of the CRB and deflationary parts of the CRB and do a ratio between the two, and this is continuing to fall. So this suggests that even though the CRB is going up, it's not necessarily producing a lot of inflationary concerns currently. Then we look at the CRB index all by itself. This is a daily chart showing that it is in an uptrend. We look at the Baltic Dry Index, which has been spiking up lately. This is what does it cost to send products from point A to point B, mainly in the Baltics. When this has been coming down, that means it costs less and it's less inflationary. As we've been seeing some geopolitical events and as oil has been going up, this has been starting to spike back up, which could be inflationary. And it's starting to cross over and actually give us an uptrend right now. So this could be a little bit of a concern. Some other markets that we look at, and really just on a weekly basis, we don't, we're not real active in these other markets, such as aluminum, where it continues to be in a downtrend. Also, corn is in a downtrend. Wheat continues to be in a downtrend. Fertilizer has been chopping back up, but it's still in a longer-term downtrend. 
Oil, this is something that does affect us where it's back in an uptrend. We got up into the mid 90s and we've been pulling back and we spent a lot of the week going down, which in the light of the geopolitical events is kind of surprising. Now that there's a little more angst going on geopolitically, we're seeing oil starting to go back up and it is in an uptrend. We look at gas, which also affects us, which has been dropping off lately and had been starting to form a new uptrend. But with this recent weakness that we've been seeing, that could roll over back into a downtrend. Keeping an eye on diesel, this is what mainly trains and big trucks use to ship products. The more it costs them, the more it's probably going to cost you when you go to the store to buy things. And this has been going up, even though it ticked down in the latest reading. Heating oil, starting to get cold now. It's also starting to resume an uptrend. Natural gas, big source of energy for folks. It's not quite into an uptrend yet, but it is starting to bounce back up. Copper, which is a barometer of the economy. When copper is under pressure, that generally means looking out into the future. It looks like the economy may be weaker. This has been assuming a downtrend now for about the last month or so. We're almost ready to cross over negative on the weekly chart, but we're not quite there yet. So this is not necessarily a positive chart. Then we look at copper, which is a barometer of the economy. Then we take a ratio of that and compare it with gold, where copper has really been underperforming gold. When you have big geopolitical events, like what's going on in Israel currently, that's when gold really starts to spike up. And you'll see that when we get to those charts. Then we look at a longer term look at the copper to gold ratio and we plot the two year yield and the 10 year yield where typically these have a tendency to go in the same general direction. Well, for the last year to year and a half, there's a real wide spread between the yields and the movement of the copper to gold ratio as the market is adjusting to new realities and possibly changing its character a bit. Here is the gold ETF where we came down and actually had a death cross. Well, then all of the geopolitical events in Israel came out and that's when you see gold start to go up and it's coming back up to its 200 day moving average, but it has not been able to cross above that. If it falls back down, then this will stay in a negative trend. If we break above this and stay above this red line, then eventually it could turn back into a positive trend. And we're seeing that same general price pattern with silver where it's created a death cross, was really going down, and then in light of geopolitical events has been going back up. We look at an end of day value for gold on the top and then an end of day value for silver. And just to kind of say what makes common sense is that the correlation between the two tends to be pretty strong. Gold and silver tend to go in the same direction at the same time. They might get out of whack for a little while, but then they have a tendency to come back into that relationship. Then we do kind of an informational study where we have a gold to silver ratio on the top. When this is going up, that means gold is outperforming. When it's going down, that means silver is outperforming. And we can compare that to the U.S. dollar index, which has been pretty strong lately. And one observation that we make on this is when the dollar index is going up, gold outperforms silver. And this has been going up. And Lately, both silver and gold have been in downtrends, but since this geopolitical mess came up, we've been seeing gold starting to outperform silver again. And then on the bottom, we can see the correlation between the two. Not as strong as it usually is, but it's still having a slight tendency for these two charts to go in the same direction at the same time. The dollar, which has been in an uptrend. We had a recent golden cross and we continued to go up and we were up on Friday's session. Then we look at the euro, which is showing some weakness compared to the dollar. And then we look at the dollar index down below. Then we look at the Japanese yen, which has also been underperforming the dollar compared with the euro and where the U.S. dollar index has been going up. And the dollar index going up is putting pressure on stocks. They tend to like a weaker dollar in the stock market. When we compare that to the Japanese yen, we can see where the blue line is below the red line. That's in a downtrend when compared to the U.S. dollar. The British pound also showing some weakness, but we're still not quite at a death cross yet. You want to go to Europe right now? You want to go to England? As this continues to go down, that's more favorable if you want to travel. It's not necessarily more favorable for earnings for stock companies, but we're not quite at giving this death cross at least yet. Some different indexes that we follow, and I show this pretty much in every daily video. The black line 
with the open high low close bar, that's the S&P 500 and that's a weighted index. So the big mega cap companies, they have more of an impact. The red line is what we call the equal weight index where all of the stocks that make up the S&P are counted the same. When this is underneath the S&P, that means that the equal weight is underperforming. And that's pretty much what we've been seeing in 2023. It's the big companies. There's a few of the mega caps that are really holding up the market right now where the rest of the market tends to be weaker. Then we look at a ratio between the S&P 500, which are stocks, and the CRB index, which is commodities or are commodities, where the S&P had been doing quite well, but it's showing some weakness, but not quite enough yet to register a death cross with this ratio. Here's an inverse of that same thing, where the CRB has been making a comeback, and but not quite there with a cross yet. We compare the NASDAQ 100, which has done well in 2023, and the S&P 500, which has also done well. And they're the big mega companies, they're in the NASDAQ 100, and they're also in the S&P 500. But when we compare the two, the NASDAQ 100 is really outperforming the S&P. Then we look at the S&P 100 and compare it with the rest of the stocks in the S&P, showing that the big companies continue to outperform. The NASDAQ, which has been doing good in 2023 in the S&P 500, this just shows that the NASDAQ is outperforming. We'll look at the NASDAQ 100 and the NASDAQ, which both have been doing well, but the NASDAQ 100 continues to outperform because of the big mega cap companies. We look at the mega cap growth and we take a ratio with the equal weight index. And this is, again, just suggesting and showing us with some proof that the mega caps are the ones that are really outperforming in the market. So if you own any stocks outside of that and you're not necessarily looking for dividends or safety, you might be a little bit disappointed because it's been the big seven companies or the great eight or the wonderful 11 or whatever category you want to create. It's been these bigger companies that have really held the market together. Then we compare small caps and they're really underperforming. We don't want to see that in this kind of an environment. The ratio between the two is the red line and that's continuing to decline. The blue line is the S&P 500. We want to see this ratio going up. That promotes more of a healthy market and uh, climate. Then here's another ratio showing how the small caps are continuing to underperform the S&P. The software companies, and this is a little bit of a warning sign. These are the big backbone of a lot of tech in the U.S. Well, we're starting to see a death cross here with this index where it had been in an uptrend, but it has been showing some recent weakness. So this is a bit of a concern. Mega caps, these are the big stocks that have been holding the market together. They continue to be in an uptrend. The robotics and AI ETF, it's really been underperforming when you look at it by itself. And it's even majorly underperforming when you compare it to a ratio of the tech sector. The Dow Jones Composite Average, which takes the Dow, the transports, and the utilities together, been chopping more or less sideways. We see a weakening trend here, but it's still a positive trend. We look at the S&P and compare it with shorter term bonds going from one to three years, holding up okay for right now, but stocks have been seeing some weakness lately and bonds, at least lately, that's been more the place to be. But as interest rates are going up, they've been pressuring bonds as well. So we're pretty much in the middle part of the rainbow currently. Then we take a broad measure of the stock market and we compare it with further out bonds. And yeah, we've been under some pressure here now, but we're still in the middle part of the rainbow. Low volatility stocks, which did better in 2022. Well, we're seeing a, now a downtrend in 2023. When we compare the low volatility stocks with the S&P, we're coming back down and hitting this previous low. Are we going to continue to fall down here or will we get some support and then bounce up from this level? We look at the tech sector and compare it with three to seven year bonds, where it's still under a bit of pressure currently, but it's been holding up fairly well with the tech sector outperforming. Then we look at some other stocks. This is a more broad based study of advanced decline line. First of all, on the top, we look at the common stock for the NYSE, where it's showing some weakness and below its moving average. We're seeing that same thing with the S&P 500, the mid caps, and we're seeing even more weakness with the small caps. We look at the traditional Dow theory, where it still hasn't come down to this previous low, at least yet, but we've been under pressure with the Dow. The transports, which we want to see them really going up if the market was more healthy, well, they're not really doing that currently. And utilities, which have been under a lot of pressure in the past week with the geopolitical events, 
People have been getting into bonds, which pushes prices up and interest rates down. And that has been helping utilities a little bit. When interest rates go up, that really hurts utility stocks. We look at the transports, which when this is going down, that means the transports are underperforming the S&P, not indicative of a really strong environment. Then we look at a, a ratio between the Dow and the transports. When this is going up, that means the Dow is outperforming, and that's typically what's been happening overall. Then we look at the relationship between the S&P and the transports, and they have a pretty strong tendency to go in the same direction. Sometimes this will get out of line with each other. But when this relationship is high and we get a high reading down here in this indicator, that means that we can follow this with some confidence that they're tending to go in the same direction. Now, it doesn't tell us the direction, but we can at least watch them go up and down together. Here's a new take on Dow theory, where instead of using the Dow, we use the S&P 500. That's a better representation of the U.S. economy. And on the bottom, instead of using the transports, we use the NASDAQ because we're more of a tech society now. And we're looking for different divergences and convergences in this chart. We're not necessarily seeing anything all that crazy at this time. The FANG index is still holding up fairly well. This is Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google, and some other stocks that are now included. We've come right back down to its 50-day moving average, and it's in a longer-term uptrend. And I've been showing this chart in the daily video and we're looking to see if we do start to break back up, are we going to go back to this previous all-time high? It looked like we were showing some improvement, but then later in the week, we started to see some weakness with this index. ARC, which is still in an uptrend, but it's a weakening uptrend as we've been spending a lot of time below its 200-day moving average. Then we look at the S&P 500 on a monthly chart. And then we do a ratio between stocks that are in Europe, Australia, Asia, and the Far East. And the ratio is still showing that the S&P 500 is outperforming the other stocks in the world. We can also look at a momentum basis where this is rolling over a bit with the PPO, but it's still positive and above zero, even though it's showing some recent weakness. But the chart itself is still suggesting their strength in the US market. Keeping an eye on bonds. The total bond ETF is now in a downtrend. This is an ETF that bases bonds on price, not their yield. We have a world bond index also based on price where it's now in a downtrend. And we can see here on a monthly chart where stocks are outperforming bonds. And this shows where bonds are underperforming stocks. So we have confirmation there. These are high yield corporate bonds. These are junk bonds. And even though they've been under some weakness, they tend to follow the stock market. They're still in a longer term uptrend. But when we look at investment grade bonds, these are more conservative. They're in a downtrend now. And when we look at the riskier versus more conservative bonds and take a ratio between the two, investors still want to be in the riskier bonds. They're willing to assume that more, more of that risk to get a higher yield on their investment. And they're not really concerned about that, at least right now. So that can give us a source of confidence. And we look at a correlation between stocks and bonds. They're having a pretty strong tendency to go in the same direction. So if stocks are going up, bonds are probably going up. And the inverse of that is also true. We look at the Dow Jones corporate bond index, which continues to be in a downtrend. So the, the riskier bonds are still hanging in there. The more conservative bonds, like corporate bonds and government bonds, they're starting to get under some pressure. We look at the 10-year yield where we're still above this 100% retracement level. We climbed up to the 4.8 area, almost got the 4.9 before coming back down. And this past week, we did see interest rates start to fall, and that was giving support to stocks. This is a longer-term look at the 10-year yield where we're breaking out above what had been a 40-year pattern here, maybe suggesting that we're going back to the old normal of a higher interest rate environment. That's not what we were seeing over a 40 year period. We saw a series of lower highs and lower lows as interest rates kept going down, 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 down to try to stimulate economic growth. Ever since the COVID plunge and ever since all this surplus was just thrown out into the US economy and now we're worried about inflation, we're having to keep interest rates high to try to keep that inflation under control and we might just stay more in this kind of an environment. We don't know that for sure. This is just a very long-term look and a possible scenario of how things are playing out. Here's the 30-year bond where we haven't gone all the way back up to this 100% retracement level yet, but we're well above the 4.7 level. 
And then we compare the S&P 500 with the rise or fall in interest rates. This is showing how the S&P has been underperforming the rise in interest rates. Junk bonds, which, yeah, they've been pulling back lately, but they're still in a longer term uptrend. And then we compare junk bonds with more conservative government bonds, and it shows how junk bonds are outperforming, which is probably the way it should be. And when this is going up, that's more positive for the environment. Looking at the 70 year, seven to 10 year treasury bond ETF, bond prices have been under a lot of pressure. We have a recent death cross here. We're below 50 with the RSI, but showing some improvement after getting extreme negative. And the MACD is also showing some improvement because bonds saw a bit of a bounce this past week. They were seen as a flight to safety in light of the geopolitical events. Here's a longer term look at a daily chart of all the different yields and how you look at all the colors and they're having a tendency to go up. Here's a weekly chart showing where the U.S. now has the highest rates, followed by the U.K. and then Germany, and even Japanese rates are starting to climb a bit. We look at the top part of this chart is the move index, which measures the volatility of bonds. The VIX measures volatility of stocks, and the correlation is not really strong right now. Then we look at a monthly chart of the price of the 30-year bond, where it's been going down longer term. But when we compare that to the CRB index, even though the CRB has been doing well on this monthly chart, it's taking a while for this to change over and actually go negative. We look at the S&P and compare it with other sectors where the materials are underperforming the S&P. Communication, one of the stronger areas in 2023, it's outperforming. The energy sector, which is bouncing back, and we're actually getting a, a golden cross here with this ratio where it had been under a lot of pressure in 2023. The financials, this is where we saw the real drop off back in March when we had the banking issues come to light. This still has not really recouped all that much, even though October can be a good month for the financials. We just keep waiting to see with interest rates going up and the difficult economic climate, are we going to get more banking news that's going to hit the markets at some point? Industrials are still in a downtrend compared to the S&P. The tech sector, another strong area in 2023, continues to be in an uptrend. Staples, which are just getting hammered. They're in a pretty severe downtrend and really underperforming the S&P. Real estate also in a solid downtrend. Utilities in a downtrend, but they have been bouncing back lately as interest rates were coming back down. We look at a ratio between the S&P and the utilities. When this is going up, that gives support to the S&P. When this is going down, that can put pressure on the S&P. The longer term move of this ratio has been up. Healthcare, which is continuing to be in a downtrend and underperforming. Here's another look showing how healthcare has been under pressure. Discretionary <clears throat> still is in a longer term uptrend, even though it's seeing some weakness. And we're seeing some overall weakness here. Now, when you, we look at some different ratios, and I'll point this out when we get there, it's not that discretionary is doing better than staples. It's that staples are really doing bad, and that's helping discretionary to look a little bit better. But we're also seeing some weakness in this area. Here's the staple sector, which is clearly in a downtrend. The tech sector, which is still in an uptrend. The semiconductors, which are also in an uptrend. The tech ratio to the S&P 500 shows how tech continues to outperform, even though the market's been under some pressure. Energy is starting to make a bit of a comeback here when compared to tech, but tech has been doing really well also. So energy continues to underperform tech. We look at growth stocks and compare them with more conservative bonds, and it shows how the growth stocks are outperforming. The tech sector has really been starting to outperform the rise in interest rates, but we're just seeing a death cross here now as the tech sector has been under a bit of pressure as interest rates have been going up. And this is an inverse of that same chart showing how the rise in interest rates is now starting to outperform the tech sector. Discretionary and staples, this is what I was referring to. And it's not that discretionary is strong, it's that staples are more weak. And here's an inverse of that same chart showing how staples are really underperforming. Gold is underperforming the S&P 500. Gold is also underperforming the dollar. High leverage loans, as I usually point out, if we were getting ready to have some severe economic times, <clears throat> these are risky loans. And if things go bad, these would be the first loans that the banks are going to say, come on, give us all your money back. We want our loan. Well, they it wouldn't be going up the way it is right now in this index. So 
Under the surface, this is still suggesting that there's confidence in the economy. The NYSE composite, been chopping sideways, but still in a weakening uptrend. All stocks also in a weakening uptrend. Merging markets are starting to roll over and give us a downtrend now. The micro caps are also dropping below 100 and continuing day after day now to set a new 52-week low. That's more negative. And then we keep an eye on the housing or the home builders ETF, where we've been under pressure with the S&P, also with the home builders. The ratio has been going down and the correlation is not really showing a big change or a big diversion, at least at this point. We're looking for divergences and convergences in this chart, and we're just not seeing that right now. Bitcoin, which is supposed to be in a positive time of seasonality, and it still could break out of that, but it just generated a recent death cross, and it's in a downtrend and starting to deal with its 50-day moving average, and if anything, has been chopping more or less sideways. Looking internationally, where China's starting to show a little bit of a bounce, we're seeing a bit of a recovery in emerging markets, where Europe is still in a downtrend, Japan's trying to turn up a little bit, and the U.S. is trying to turn up slightly as well. The intermarket analysis chart, going back to the beginning of 2023, stocks are still in the lead, followed by oil, then the dollar, then gold. Ever since the first part of August, bonds have gone negative based on price. Some different correlations. We compare the S&P with the dollar index, and they're having a pretty strong tendency to go in opposite directions. If the dollar is up, stocks are down and vice versa. We compare the S&P to oil, almost neutral here, not really giving us much of an indication right now as the market is shifting. Comparing the S&P 500 to the 10-year yield, fairly strong in the opposite direction. And the tech sector to the 10-year yield, after going in the same direction for a while, went through the neutral area and are having a slight tendency to go in opposite directions. Tech companies have to borrow a lot to do their research and development to build new factories. If interest rates go up, that really bites into tech companies' earnings. Looking at a shorter-term basis, the S&P to the two-year yield, they're having a pretty strong tendency to go in opposite directions. Some long-term secular, which can be decades, and cyclical trend studies, which is usually a few years. We look at the NYSE composite on a monthly basis, and we're showing some weakness here and dropping below the moving average. The momentum, as measured by the Copic curve, it's still above zero, but starting to roll over as well. So this is longer term, potentially negative. We also look at a daily chart of the NYSE and compare it with the NYSE record high percent index, where it had been going up and now it's starting to go back down. So this is also a sign of concern. We look at the S&P 500 on a monthly chart and it's coming back down to this moving average. It hasn't dropped below it yet. We are seeing some weakness, though, when we look at the PPO, or percentage price oscillator. So this is just starting to register now the weakness that we've been seeing over the last couple of months. When we compare the S&P 500 with the CRB, this is a monthly chart. Actually, this is a daily chart where we're seeing the S&P coming back down to the moving average. And the S&P has been doing quite well, and the CRB has been doing well, but not enough to really roll over this KST, which is another momentum oscillator that we follow. Then we look at the S&P 500 and look at another global index where we're still above the moving average here. That's positive. The KST is still negative, but trying to turn back up. Then at the very end, I go through all the different things that are positive and then negative. My definition of positive is when the 50-day simple moving average is above its 200-day simple moving average. We have the growth indexes and ETFs, which are positive, the CRB index, the dollar, the euro and the British pound to the US dollar, but that could be getting ready to change soon if we see more strength in the dollar. The mega caps are still holding up well, the Dow Jones composite average, the FANG index, as well as ARC, even though ARC has been under pressure and we're seeing a weakening trend there. Bonds based on the high yield or junk bonds, they're still hanging in there and doing positive or in a positive trend. The tech sector and the semiconductors, high leverage loans, the Dow and the mid caps, even though the mid caps are showing some weakness, the NASDAQ and NASDAQ 100 have been holding up well, the NYSE composite, even though it's showing a weakening trend, and then all stocks are also showing some weakness, but still in a longer term uptrend. Then we look at the negative things, and that's when the 50-period moving average goes below the 200-period moving average. We have the value indexes, which have been under pressure. 
Gold and silver, which are still in downtrends. Copper's in a downtrend. The Japanese yen compared to the U.S. dollar. The Dynamic Software Index. Those are the 30 biggest software companies. This is a new addition to the list. That's a bit of a concern. That's tech, and we're seeing weakness there. The S&P 500 Low Volatility ETF, which did great in 2022 or better, and is really suffering in 2023. The staples are in a downtrend. The total bond ETF, world bonds are going down. The small caps, and now we have micro caps, which are hitting new 52-week lows. Emerging markets are also in a downtrend. Investment grade and corporate bonds. So more conservative bonds are under pressure where the riskier bonds are still doing okay. And the Bitcoin index, which is just seen a recent death cross and is pretty much chopping sideways. Thank you. I hope you found this helpful. I do post other videos. Please feel free to check out the daily video and the weekly video. And then after this, I'll be posting what I call the deep dive video, where I look at other video or other charts that I don't necessarily talk about in each day's video. Have a great weekend, and I will talk to you in the next video.